Good evening. Nice to see all of you. The day Raymond Abram died, Steve Hall sent me a note offering to do a talk at SciArc. Remember that? <laughs> Made it up. Uh, uh, this evening, I want to thank Stephen for his offer and let him know that we accept. Tonight is the first annual Raymond Abram Memorial Lecture. Raymond was an architect who resided everywhere, New York, Austria, California, Mexico, and belonged nowhere. Raymond's home was in his head, a kind of intellectual Bedouin. Whatever the many differences between Raymond and Stephen, perhaps they are both intellectuals in transit. I recall Raymond discussing the parable of the Gordian knot, that intricately, intricately entwined rope with no visible end or beginning. All the esoteric practitioners over many years attempt to untie it. The architect arrives, pulls his sword, cuts the knot, leaving the rope in pieces. Slightly modified version. The decisiveness of the cut and the surprise nature of the, of the assault on that indissoluble knot are what's conventionally celebrated. But I've always wondered what the amended parable would symbolize if the architect retied the rope. I think Stephen Hall is attempting to retie the rope. In the world where most of us operate, quick, glib caricatures of events and people are the rule. Impatience feed feeds impatience feeds short attention spans. The architecture discourse is loaded with capsule characterizations labels and acronyms in lieu of a more time-consuming interrogatory. But from time to time, in the midst of that abbreviated thought process, the inadequacy of instant content becomes obvious. Holes work, for instance. Don't start with folds, contexts, or porosities. No green, clean, or digital. Forget parametric allegiances. Lacan, Deleuze, and Foucault aren't part of the advisory team. Hull offers us an alternative worldview. He implicates us, makes us participants in his story, and insists the participants respond. He designs us in and we're obligated to imagine a way around and out if we can. Hull makes architecture mandatory. Abstention isn't an option. Stephen is the rare architect who produces astonishing objects by refusing to produce astonishing objects. Like Columbus, Hull sails west to go east. The conventional bracketing of architects works into a priori categories amidst the prospect of a categorical imperative that transcends categorization. Stephen makes the usual categories extraneous. No modern, machine, decon, parametric, green experiment. Yes to affiliations, but none of those listed uncovers the motives not to simply experiment, but to discover the premise on which the experiment sits. As an abstract, the whole venue is the world of ideas, not as fixed propositions, but rather as the tension between contradictory possibilities. Paradoxically, the whole architecture is never an abstract. To build his argument, the architect situates himself in the midst of a tangible human dilemma and builds that contradictory experience. 
How does he do that? Psychological probing, no Prozac, no sessions on the couch, but rather a chronology that resonates with the mind as the mind encounters the variability of form and space. Tried the Chirico's darkness at noon, for instance, not just the shadow, not just the capacity to build that shadow, it's the assembly of darkness and light that makes the experience breathe. Not arbitrary, it's necessity. <clears throat> Ever been treated by a physical therapist? Bend your body, stretch your mind. It's the integration of the two that repairs the damage. Physical therapy is part of the whole pro forma. And then there's the choreography, a wandering, wandering dance from the end to the beginning. But no tricks, no rabbits, no hats. Joy too, joy too. Not the cheerleader's kind, more an admixture of human joy and sadness and a sense of what's tragic in human affairs. More Ecclesiastes, less zippity doo da. Then there's the cosmology, somewhere between Darwinian gradualism and a rock hitting the Yucatan. Never the object qua object, but the object perpetually metamorphosizing. What if laughter were really tears? Not just architecture, but an ethos for architecture. Please welcome Stephen Hall to the first annual Raymond Abram Memorial Lecture. It's an honor to be here, of course. It's always an honor to be at SciArc. When Eric asked me to give this talk, I said yes, but then I didn't realize how difficult it would be because I began to think about Raymond, who is, for me, as difficult in his absence as he was in his presence difficult. And I, I wanted to speak a little bit about him, but I've decided I'm just going to read a poem. Time is dying on the moon. I hear the minutes limping round and round. Forgive me this minute. The hours are creaking past these midnight bones. That's Theodore Rothke, Straw for the Fire. This talk I've never given before, so it's really rough around the edges, and it's for Raymond. So I thought of a kind of, let's say, link. And I'm thinking of Piranese, of course, and how important the unbuilt architecture is in the history of architecture. For those of you who know about the, an enormous polemic that went on during the 1750s between Winkleman and, and Piranese, Piranese argued for the new, always argued for invention. Winkleman argued for the neoclassical. You know, we've seen these kinds of battles going on. And when I think about this Cartieri drawing, I think about, okay, the Escher-like incompleteness, Eric's untied knots, but I think it, but in, in a way the essence of this is ambiguity. And the ambiguity can be something kind of frightening, but at the same time very positive. So that's sort of, that's sort of my hinge point. In fact, I think we're all working in an enormous time of ambiguity. The instant communication blurs time and place in a continuous flow. The idea of a site as a is as digital as it is physical. Still, architecture is bound to situation. Architecture can concretize meaning on a site. That's internet traffic. Ambiguity of scale. Scale is measured comprehension of space. The urban densities in new sectional configurations provoke megaforms of ambiguous scale. 
These mysterious scales can be exhilarating. Their juxtapositions sublime. That would be a positive ambiguity. Ambiguous systems. Instead of stable systems, we must work with dynamic systems. In a hypermobile population with constant flux of people, information, materials dissolve and disp disperse. Architecture can act as a partial stabilizer. Public space is a kind of DNA for democracy. Ambiguous programs. Instead of programmatic precision, we must work with contingent and diverse programs. Instead of precision of use, we must work with crossbred systems and combined methods. Yet the hybrid building may be the most vital new urban tool, living, working, recreation, and culture in a compact fragment. Clarity of concept. A clear concept acts as a force that drives design beyond ambiguities and contingencies. Architecture today, unlike any time in history, is free to be inspired by any source, music, literature, or science might provoke new concepts. So to take this ambiguity and then take it into, let's say, a few projects. The first project is in Beijing, a very centrally located uh, site at the, at the second ring road. And the problem of Beijing, maybe a little bit like LA, but more so in Beijing, is if you have one appointment, it can take you all day to get over the city and back again. And the city is, you know, in a way, enormously polluted anyway. So the idea of a kind of dense, a dense place where living, working, and cultural activity and recreation can all take place in one, one area was a kind of a priori thought we had when we were invited to work here. The pre-1980 Beijing is horizontal you see no building can be higher than the forbidden city. Post-1980, Beijing becomes vertical. And when it becomes vertical, it becomes isolated. It becomes point towers. It becomes gated communities. So our project became a kind of, let's say, utopian effort to do something other than that. In a way, to make a kind of place where all these activities could be compressed and condensed and on several levels. Because the city is so dense, you could have shops at the ground level, shop, uh, office at a midpoint, and a, and a whole ring of shops in the air. So this became a kind of method of thinking about the project. And by the way, this, the program from the client was just 800 apartments. And we, we had the idea of making a public space and making the maximum amount of programs. So, so we said, look, give us three months and a certain amount of uh, honorarium and we'll go away and we're gonna come back with an ideal vision. So we came back with a Montessori school kindergarten, a Cinematheque, um, many different kinds of shops, hotels, spa. This place becomes a place that's like a city within a city. And it was interesting, and here you see the top, the top level with, you can see spa, you can see a swimming pool in one of the bridges, you can see cafes, you can see a bookstore. The interesting thing about this condition of the ambiguity of program is the client is so, in a way, without direction that they say, after a certain pause, they say, we like, first of all, I thought there's no way they're going to build all this, right? They're not going to do it. It's just too much. It's like a student project. I'm putting all these different things in here. You know, I mean, I think to myself, how could I even, you know, propose all that stuff? And suddenly, you know, uh, they decided they wanted to build the whole thing. And I said, my God, how could they go from eight towers and 800 apartments to building a Cinematheque, a Montessori school, all these bridges, one with a swimming pool in it? Um, then I thought there's going to be a problem with the budget. So we sent the drawings, <clears throat> and they sent back, after about a month, they sent back an email. They said, your project greatly exceeds our budget. <laughs> However, we're raising our budget to meet your project. Don't take anything out. So, but the, key, the, 
the kicker was there would be no increase in fee. <laughs> so basically, we did the Cinematheque for free. We did the Montessori School for free. We did, and we lost something like $900,000 on the project. And anyway. The other thing about the, the, these kinds of clients is they were super ambitious in terms of energy. So this was the largest geothermal project when it was uh, built in, I think, in residential history. 660 geothermal wells, 100 meters deep. And they are up and running now. They've been going on for three years, four years, providing all the cooling and heating for the whole complex. That means no uh, cooling towers, none of that noise, none of that off, off heat. Also, it's 100% recycled water. That means everything, every apartment has two plumbing systems and they go to a gigantic uh, zapping tank with a, with a special uh, uh, carbon neutral uh, system that basically changes everything into potable water. Uh, another slide will show you the, 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 the ponds in the middle. And then the construction, the process of construction, that was also a kind of nightmare. That made me have to open a Beijing office, which I didn't want to do, but uh, we still have it now. But the, the, the buildings themselves are exoskeletal frames, concrete frames, and the bridges were suspended between them, and Guy Nordenson did the engineering, and they were jacked into place by four very thin cable hydraulic jacks. But because of earthquake loads, they had to be on ball bearings. They couldn't be attacked, uh, attached to either tower. So these bridges are all disconnected to the fabric of the buildings. The process is also something crazy. Here you see the workers occupying the hotel during construction. All those, none of those bridges are actually attached to any of the towers. They're all on big, gigantic rollers. So when an earthquake comes, these, these towers can move a meter, a meter and a half in each direction, and the bridges just roll back and forth. There's inside some of the, the sort of performance space, um, a library and exhibition space. There's the Cinematheque, and, and uh, the Cinematheque was crucial to the life of the project. There's the central pond, all recycled water which also is a big public space. And the way you experience this project is, in a way, partial views between buildings coming at it from different directions. And it becomes a kind of experience in partial views and porosity. We can go inside from any, any aspect, from any, from any level. Exoskeletal frame expressed in sanded aluminum. And the lighting uh, becomes a kind of polychrome harking back to ancient Chinese polychrome. But the reality of the project is that the developer still had in his mind a gated community. And they tried to build a wall around the project, but they couldn't because we'd placed the Cinematheque and the shops inside and that would kill the life of the Cinematheque. So it was like a strategy, a counter strategy to, to keep the place as a public open space. And today it's a public open space. So while that was going on, we were invited to do another project, and, and this was a competition. This is like uh, Shenzhen, which is one of the most mysterious places on Earth, as it was something like 8,000 people in 1980, and now it's over 12 million. So it's the fastest growing piece of urban territory on the, in the history of the planet. So this, this ambiguity of place, what is the place of Shenzhen? You know, what, what really is it? Where's, what's the context? There isn't really a context that you can get a hold of because it changes daily, weekly. And actually, I, you, I, I really encourage you to visit it. It's absolutely fascinating. So our site was a little bit to the east of Shenzhen, and it was backed by a mountain, and it was on the seashore. So I began to think about a building that would be somehow as if it was floating on the sea and the sea had receded, as if it was propped up on legs and somehow the, there was another force that caused it to be. There was a 35 meter height limit and in that 35 meters 
you couldn't, you really didn't have enough program to fill it. So the first, the, t the diagram at the top is what, uh, what many of the other planners did. There were like five people in the competition. And we decided to just try something. In a way, this is a competition. You know, I feel like I'm in school. I'll just try something. So let's put the whole building up at 35 meters and put it on like eight legs. Then every, every piece of the program gets a view of the ocean. And there's a microclimate bef below it. This is a tropical space. This is Hong Kong. It's, you know, shade is really something wonderful. So the idea that everyone is with an ocean view and then everything has a kind of a, a, a microclimate below it and gardens below it. So these are the different programs, two types of offices, a condominium and a hotel. And then we added more, we added a, a 500 seat auditorium and and shops and restaurants in the mounds below. And that's the scale. Again, it's a kind of project that you would you know, give your students and you would never expect to build, right? I mean, and here's the mountains uh, behind it. So this is perfect feng shui. You're sp in feng shui, you're supposed to be with your back against the mountains and facing the south and facing a body of water. So the shape of the building, the form of the building, really takes the form of the site and the idea of this backdrop in a feng shui view to the sea. There was the original master plan at the top. Um, and you can see the figure ground that allows for only 28,000 square meters of green space. Then our proposal, which is to keep the whole site green and, and, and actually have a, a green roof. So we end up with 75,000 square meters of green space. So the whole building floats above this landscape, which we also shaped with different functions in the mounds. And you can see the figure hovering over the landscape. I remember the, in the competition, I went down to Shenzhen, and the, the client who's, this is the largest housing developer in South China. The client's name is Wang She. The whole meeting went very silently because it, uh, he doesn't speak a word of English. And so it was translated from my English to the Chinese. And then at the end of the meeting, he waited for everyone to make a remark and then simply said, I love it. I love the shape. So then we had the problem of trying to build it. And the, the, the cores were uh, 50 meters apart. And we said, well, let's, let's bring them 30 meters together so they won't be so difficult. But our engineer, Kao Shengjing, had the idea of putting a cable stay technology to work with a rigid concrete frame. There he is in the Beijing laboratory where they tested the building. And they loaded it with 40 tons of lead. And it's a scale model of a rigid concrete frame with cable stay technology that proves that this system, which has never been tried before, could, could work. The key to the system, of course, is the joints where the load has to be shifted from the high degree of tension to the concrete frame. Some of these tension cables take something like 3,280 tons of tension force, which is higher than any tension force ever attempted in building construction before. And there become, that's my partner, Lee Hu, who was key in development of this project. And there's, there's the big problem in the, in, in the idea, and that is the transfer of the high degree of tension to the rigid concrete frame. So these enormous cast iron joints had to be made in Nanjing and shipped down sort of two or three on a truck. And what was interesting is, like in America, if you, you run into a problem like this, you'll get these screaming phone calls and they'll threaten to throw you off the job. In China, they just do it, and you just see it showing up on the site. Uh, everybody on the site was very happy. I helped clean up the site often when I was there. <laughs> I don't know what the story is about all these sad workers in China, but every time I went to the site, I found people very happy. There they are jacking the in enormous load for the, concrete, uh, for the uh, tension cables. So these are sort of pressure meters. They build the building kind of backwards with putting tension on the bottom control plate and then filling in the floor, floors afterwards. So the, the key is the, 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 
sort of axis of tension has to pass through exactly the axis of the column. So you end up with these rather magnificent lollipop-like columns with holes in them. I don't know what happened to that slide. And also the speed. We won the competition in July of 2006, and they started construction in November. And this is a view two years later in 2008. Some friends visiting the site. <laughs> so this 50 meter span is a building without trusses. So some, some of these buildings that recently that are all trusses on the inside. This building has no trusses, just these thin tension cables. And then sort of to invigorate the program, we added different pieces and parts like this 500 seat auditorium which is also another strange thing about these clients, is on a Saturday afternoon, we decided one of these mounds should be hollowed out, and we wanted to add a 500-seat auditorium, so we emailed back, and they said, fine, add it. So it's all in foamed aluminum, and the, and the, the furniture was from Poltrona Fra in Italy, and the foamed aluminum was made in Canada because they couldn't get the texture proper to our, our our, our specifications. So like contrary to some situations where everything is made in China and shipped here, we're making things in Italy and Canada and shipping it to China. And by the way, we do most of the design work in America, so the, the idea of jobs going to China is not true. We are, we're employing people in, in New York to work in China. There's Poltrona Froze seating. The entrance lobby in that, that coming down, sort of escalators coming down to the auditorium and the convention level. And the idea of, of, of the sun, this is a very tropical climate, so it's very hot. And I was in a tropical situation sketching uh, palm fronds, and I thought of the reverse, to, to make the palm frond shape be actually the, the penetration in, in aluminum and make those be the louvers of the building. So what's nice is here, they make everything, so we, all this is custom made. And it's all activated by computer, so it follows the track of the sun. Detailing on the interiors, down to the doorknob that Jeff Kipnis hates. He said, Stephen, whatever you do, don't do that doorknob. <laughs> Good old Jeff. The digitally cut screens to regulate the sunlight instead of curtains. This is bamboo. A section through the, the main offices, which we call the untie bow tie section, because no one wears a tie at that office. So we're just going to take a bow tie and untie it and make the whole section of the building respond to that geometry. At night, this, this sort of place takes another life. And down those cores, each of those cores carry all the services uh, from above. So because of the complexity of the program above, you need access to all the plumbing and services, and the glass rides outside the concrete core about a meter and a half. So that means they all have access to all the utilities. This is also all recycled water. Some of my photographs of the, of the louvers and the undersides the feeling of, of kind of flying above and the, the sort of connection to the landscape below. Fire escapes then puncture the underside of the building. And you can see the, the sort of tie lines of the, the, the tension cables are exposed in the spirit of Kenneth Frampton that structure should somehow be expressed. And the, I, the, the idea of this ambiguity, I think, this ambiguity of scale, the building has an ambiguity. When you come onto the site, you really don't see it. It's 20 meters in the air, so you can actually, you come onto the site and it feels like there's no, there's no building there. It's just a landscape. And then when you look up, like from the courtyard below, there's a, there's a layering between the underside, which is the sixth elevation of the building, the facade, and let's say the courtyard down below. So we invented this thing called a 360 window, which drops down out of the sixth elevation and allows you to see all around the site.
all the windows open. There's a kind of vapor court there at the kind of uh, conference center down below. That creates its own microclimate. We did the landscape, but then they ran, they ran out of funds at a certain point. So we said, well, let's just let, it's tropical, and let's just let the birds and the natural take its course. And this it grew up into an amazing series of natural weeds and natural grasses and natural plants. Some of it we actually manicured. There you see bamboo growing. So this is a kind of public landscape open to everyone. And uh, the, the, the hotel, I think, opens in the fall. So this project is really something I, I think was something I never thought I would build. And uh, it's quite amazing to, to have it be realized. Something closer to home in Kansas City. And this has to do with the ambiguity of figure and ground of building and landscape. The fusing of building and landscape it was a competition. And the five uh, other architects in the competition followed the rules. They said, you must add on to the north side of the building. And you're not allowed to go down into the landscape. I, I went to the site and I decided that was what we weren't going to do. We were going to break the rules and uh, actually make a kind of dialectic where the original building is a kind of stone, the new building would be like a feather. Where the original building is an enfilade of circulation, the new building would be open circulation. So this whole dialectic back and forth, so this, this becomes something quite uh, in contrast to that. And the, when I, I presented this to the competition, to the jury, I said, excuse me for breaking the rules, but I found the, uh, the courage in an inscription in your stone facade where it said, the soul has greater need of the ideal than of the real. So they, they went for it. <laughs> this is a, a painting in their collection, which, is, which I found fascinating. It's by Zhao Shen. It's, it's called the North Sea from the year 366. And this idea of fusing landscape and architecture something that's kind of deep in their collection, in their, in their Asian collection, was, that also helped me argue for the, for the project. The building itself becomes almost like chunks of ice floating in the grass. And this notion of the physical form really taking on this, this absolute, let's say, drifting uh, landscape aspect. So the main connection to the old building was crucial. And that's that was discovered by my partner, Chris McVoy, where you could remove two walls here and actually create a secondary axis. So the whole building is like a kind of skyscraper lying down in the landscape. Sculpture gardens are created between these lenses. The, the whole circulation of this building then connects to the back to the circulation of the main building through this incision that creates a kind of complete two-part architecture. Everything is serviced from below and then one enters either at the parking level or at the top level, at the grade level, and it's a whole series of open-ended circulations that move through all the galleries in many different ways. You can by bypass some galleries, cut through some galleries. The entrance is a piece by Walter D. Maria called One Sun and 34 Moons. This is his One Sun, which is a, a disc 500 feet in diameter of gold leaf sliced at the top. And the 34 moons were really part of our competition entry. So we allowed him to replace those and become part of his artwork. That way, they would never put a Botero or something in the front of the museum. So even at, during the winter, these bring light down to the parking garage below. So they become part of his artwork, but also changing the space of arrival. And this is a, a kind of dramatic space. In fact, before the museum opened, we found people downstairs in this garage having picnics, uh, putting their tables up underneath these spotches of light and the, and the water above making these move down below. The main entrance, connecting the main lens, connecting the whole sequence, connecting the upper level and the lower level. 
the stair up to the trustees room and the library, which Guy Nordenson did as a single beam, which had to be actually put in place before the pavilion was built. And then exposing the truss, the single truss that holds up that, that glass pavilion. This was an invention for the light and also for the air conditioning called fluttering tees. So all the services for the air is moved up through these tees and this holds up the lens but brings in north light on one side and south light on the other side. So bringing that kind of cool blue light and the sort of warm light of the south and mixing it just subtly. You can see it here where there's the warm south light and this is the cool blue north light. Mixing it in each of the galleries giving the whole museum a, a special condition of natural light. Of course, curators always black this out, but we provide it anyway, you know. And there's that moment where the condition of the old building is sliced through and you get the circulation connecting both the old and the new. Some of the great parts of their collection is the largest Noguchi collection in America. So we envision right in the competition uh, Noguchi's piece Fountain with a section of, of, of an unfinished piece out in the distance in the landscape that's pretty close to the way it was realized. The Noguchi court. And a special material was devised um, 16 inches wide in German optical glass. This, this is a structural plank which really brings a kind of diffused light to everything in the lenses. So these become almost, it's almost as if the building is built out of blocks of light. And it's all open uh, seven days a week and 24 hours a day so the people of Kansas City can actually really enjoy this as a public space. It's also a building that's free, unlike the Museum of Modern Art, which costs you a lot of money to go in. In Kansas City, you can go to this museum for free. And the sculpture garden is accessible from about eight places along the edges of the building. So this notion of how the thing changes in time, here it is on a sunny day, there it is in the winter, and, and at night. This whole feeling, I mean, it, it, it's the idea that's driving the design, but also the phenomena of how the building changes, how we experience that change. This is the, one of the newest projects just opening in a month and a half City de Surf et la Océan in Biarritz, France. It was a competition for a surf museum right in the coast of the, the, the real surfing area of actually the only surfing area of Europe. Biarritz is right here. And it's also a project about the health of the ocean. So the idea of the of the, the of the mayor and his staff was to make a surfing museum, but also make a museum that could tell everyone about ecology and about the health or the lack of health of the ocean. So when I made my pr uh, presentation, I, uh, added, I made my introduction that, in fact, I'm from the West Coast. And when I graduated from high school with my best friend, we surfed every beach from Washington State down to Mexico. And uh, that gave me a little bit of uh, knowledge about the surf. Everybody else was dressed in black. All the other uh, architects were dressed in black, looking very academic. And there you see the, 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 the two rocks, which are part of the big surfing beach, and brought back as glass rocks in the building. And the whole landscape going out to the ocean edge is now being realized. So the basic concept of the building is under the sky and under the sea. A single, simple idea, which creates a big public space on top and creates the sort of implosion of the feeling of the curvilinear feeling of space at the bottom. And a public space uh, uh, tilted towards the ocean horizon. So that was from the competition drawings. The models, we, we made uh, numerous models uh, over the t period of about two years. We won the competition in 2005. This notion of being able to see down and see the great Exhibition hall from the entrance. I think this has a this has a, a 
bit of a video, but maybe it's not working. No, it's not. That's all right. Every beam in this building was different um, because of the curvilinear aspect, so every beam had to be cast in a special casting. And then molds had to be made for, for the, the swimming pool, which is, uh, was inspired by Dogtown, the idea of incorporating a, a swimming pool that was dry, that allowed the skateboarders to use it. Of course, the mayor really got up in arms about this, but they began using it before the building was finished. So that, that kind of life of surf culture is, is alive and well in, in, in France as well as America. Building is all in white concrete, all cast in place. And you can see the kind of glass of the entrance, the, the sort of ramp inviting you to the main plaza, the view out to the sea. This is all Portuguese stone with grass growing between, uh, the restaurant with a, with a kind of terrace overlooking the ocean, and that feeling of a, of a kind of, let's say, magical space connected to the sky, under the sky, under the sea. So this feeling of the clouds going by, and the, the, the guardrails are all in German optical glass, so the sun catches those guardrails, and they create the sort of wonderful lines, and in, in sometimes cast on the, on the plaza itself or the change in weather is picked up by these very thin sandblasted glass, German optical glass guardrails. The feeling of coming in and going down, the curv curv curvature of the space, details in, in uh, enameled steel, terrazzo stairs, coming down to the wood floor. There's one skylight in the space. This will be filled with exhibitions by uh, exhibition designers in Paris, which we can't control. But we did, we did have one skylight, that, which is a kind of oculus that brings its natural light down. And underneath the skate pool, a kind of pregnant whale feeling of space. The, the kiosk and the restaurant are enough to light the whole building at night, so the whole public space is lit at night just from the nature of the of these buildings glowing. And it's made, the, the, the glass itself is made of okalux, which looks like foam. Uh, and when you look at the end of it, it's like polar bear hair with little straws. And the way I sold it to the mayor, as I said, it's la cum de la mer, the foam of the sea. And he said, oh, well, in that case, we have to have it. <laughs> so, it's not a space you can skate in. You can skate in the pool. The Portuguese stones uh, make it too rough. But it is a space that curves out to the sea and cups, uh, in a way, cups the space of the sky. Two other little projects that I, I think are full of ambiguity. Uh, this one, the Museum of the Visigoths in Toledo, Spain, is really about the, ab uh, the ambiguity of the origin of, 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 of a people which became the object of this, this museum. This was a competition. I don't know if, if any of you have been to Toledo, which is an amazing, dense town in the middle of Spain with the Tajo River that kind of wraps it like a rubber band, uh, causing this dense fabric. But our site is out here in the plain, a sort of nothing zone, a kind of, let's say, flat territory. And, the, and, the, and the, like researching the, 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 the sort of origin of the Visigoths, they came from barbaric tribes. They came from uh, the Germanic, uh, the Byzantine, Roman Christian. There really is a mystery of this culture, which really somehow needed to be captured in a building some way. And I mean, the first thought was that the building needed to be dispersed uh, in, in a sense in the opposite feeling of the compression of the city, the sort of, these I made on site. Um, this is an amazing place to visit. The, the, the hill shape and the Taj River, the way they compress this whole town, this fabric of this town. But in a way, our site is the opposite. It's dispersed. So we had the thought of, in a way, warping the ground and causing, in a way, 
the building to just occur almost as if it was a piece of the earth. And that was the first sketch made about the, about the site. Bring a piece of the Tajo River into the space. And the idea of, the, the, the whole idea of the form of the building then came a little bit from El Greco's views of Toledo. I thought of those wonderful, incredible, mysterious paintings of El Greco. And what if we could just take the holes in the clouds and make those holes in the clouds become holes in a folded plane of earth, then that would be, in a way, the whole building would be a pergola of shadows. So we actually, this is, a, this is before we decided literally to take the holes in the clouds, so these holes are a little less articulate. But then finally, in the, in the final project, we actually took the holes in the clouds from El Greco. And you can see the building is just in one level, and it's in this kind of fold of the earth. Exhibition space, completely flexible, lit from, from the holes in the clouds that go all the way down to the, to the, to the water court, which is a, this great pergola of shadows, a place of arrival. So for me, the project is about time. It's about this mysterious origin of the Visigoths. Where do they come from? You know, what fragments we have? And how does that connect to, to now? And I, I thought about St. Augustine. In fact, I'm writing a text about time, which is a very difficult text, very ambiguous. What then is time? If no one asks me, I know. If I want to explain it to a questioner, I do not know. We measure times. But how can we measure what does not exist? The past is no longer. The future, not yet. And what of the present? So another project which is ambiguously fusing urbanism, architecture, and landscape. And somehow it's mixing all these into some third thing, a project for a competition that I'm sorry to say we didn't win. Zaha won it, and Zaha's piece is under construction. I was visiting it the other day. But this notion here for us was the idea of a weave. It's in the Kangbuk area of Seoul, Korea, which is a, a very dense fabric, almost like woven together. One of the rules of the competition was you had to indicate the old castle wall, so we decided we would build that in glass glass planks or glass block. And then the entire building itself would be a three-dimensional park in a triaxial weave of structure. So there would be park space on three different levels. And it would gradually merge with a tower figure. So this whole structure would then fold up and become a tower figure. It's called World Design Park, but there's an enormous programmatic component, you know, convention center. Uh, the Koreans are really great about uh, saying of what a park is because it has like 20 other uh, you know, programmatic requirements. So this really was a way of addressing all these things and somehow making a, 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 this, this figure which is yet another thing. And it, uh, the forms of the hexagon really result from the triaxial weave of the structure, all in post-tension uh, steel in a concrete frame. So we, we thought also as the building grew up that it would somehow turn into a fabric form and that would somehow give it a glow as it would go through this sort of phase change and transform itself in the vertical dimension. And there's some of the programs, the, the park, the education center, design information center, convention hall, special exhibition hall, underground shopping mall, many different aspects to the program which I'm sure are still changing. And just views of how it integrates itself, the sort of fuzzy edges of how it would integrate itself in that urban frame. You could come and go in all different zones. This used to be a, a, a football stadium, and now the whole thing is taken over as a public space. There's the old castle wall which passes through the space of the, of the new form. And at night, the sort of condition of three-dimensional park glowing as it turns into a tower. So to drop down in scale, also in Seoul, and, and, and to go to 
this sort of dimension of anything can, can be architecture, anything can be the beginning point of architecture. This is a project for an ideal client in a way, uh, someone who wants to build a giant gallery and have a house and a guest house. I, I, did a, I think I did 25 different schemes. Um, it's a very impacted and dense site. And at a certain point, I, de I decided, you know, it's a place about art and music. And at a certain point, I found this score by Arnhold Isfahan from 1967 and decided that this building could be based on a musical score, to take these fragments of the musical composition, pull them apart, and make the staff actually become skylights. So the, the piece was called Symphony of Modules. And we, we sort of took it apart and made that become basically the formation of the, the structure of the project. So there's a guest house, an uh, entrance pavilion, and a main house, all over a great gallery that underlies the pond system. And you can see how they talk back and forth across this water pond. That's the, the sort of impacted area of these houses. And this, this, there's a gallery that underlies this whole space and the skylight system going above 55 different skylights that bring light into this complex. The entrance pavilion, which you arrive from below, and at a certain moment, you're, you're at shoulder, you're at sort of elbow height, you see across the water pond, and you see both the guest house and the main house. And it's as if the, the building is pushing up from below, so this whole gallery system, which is the main underpinning of the house, gets pushed up in three different pavilions from below. It's a, it's, the project is for the, uh, the director of Diang Shipping Company. And he wanted a perfect project for his guests to sort of his art collection. And it's in a way, it's, it's one of those projects where you really can do every single detail. Um, and it's a rare, you know, those opportunities where every, every part and every piece, every light fixture, every aspect which brings me back to my earlier work, which really was about houses, about apartments, the joy of making those every single detail in the drawings. There you see it under construction. You can see the skylight system in the roof, the steel roof structure, bamboo form concrete at the base. We split bamboo in half and become a kind of formwork, which hides the form ties the steel structure over the water pond. And at a certain point, I wanted to do this in red and brass, but at a certain point, the Korean uh, uh, contractor couldn't make the red and brass the color and the texture. So we said, we really have to do this at Zaner's in Kansas City. And the client said, fine, it has to be perfect. So all the whole skin of this building is being made in Kansas City and shipped and, and, and being installed in Korea. So this is, again, this opposite flow, being made in America and shipped and installed in Asia. There it is under construction. The entrance, right at the entrance. A kind of relief of the whole project, a sort of fountain at, right at the entrance in cast, cast brass. So the last project is the most exciting one for me. It's a community library for Queens. And it's, the condition is really a site that's overbuilt. Um, these, there are several new towers being built now, right, right around here. So the library is supposed to service this whole new community. It's impossible because the towers are sort of 50 times larger than the size of the library. So this ambiguity of the problem is that the library at 20,000 square feet, which is supposed to serve this whole community, has no physical presence. The site is large enough you could build the whole building in one story. I think we did like 20 schemes, and I thought the real problem of this project is it needs a presence. I mean, it's a public space. It's, it's serving the community. It is a library. So I saw the context really as, in a way, the Pepsi Cola sign, in a way, the whole, this, it's right on the edge of the water. This is the Gantry Park. 
And it's a very particular site because there's Lukon's FDR memorial under construction. There's uh, Oscar Niemeyer and Le Corbusier's UN building. And right there is our site. This, and these are all those big condominium towers, kind of bulky. But this little, little piece of land will be a community library. So the context in model form, that's the size of the building. So the idea was to inscribe the elevation in a, in a circuit that would re always reveal the Manhattan views. So one of, the, one of the aspects of the client, they said, we must take advantage of the view in Manhattan. So we decided that the whole movement through the building could be, in a way, sliced in the facade. So you could, in a way, the whole circulation system would cut a figure in this facade. It's sort of 80 feet high and 40 feet wide. That was one idea. And the second idea is, what's the problem, I mean, today in a library? It's, it's the problem of digital media and the book. When I go into REMS library in Seattle, I go into the first floor. The entire first floor is just people on computers. There's no sign of any, any book. So this idea of somehow uniting the feeling of, of a library. So here, everybody is on computers. They're all on computers, but at their backs, are the books. So when you come in and, and look up, you see stacks. So the whole view in from the inside, the first view is stacks, 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 but everybody's on their computers. So there's a kind of fusion of these two elements. And the building section really is uh, expressive of the children's library, the teens library, and the main library. So the three cuts, there are these three cuts in this gigantic facade which give it a kind of presence inside the children's library. And there you see this, this feeling of, of a building which is really sliced by all these forces that are going on inside of it. Otherwise, a very simple prism, 80 feet by 40 feet, defining a public space. So this is how we argued that we didn't want to build the building all on one level. We said, we're going to define a reading garden here. Michael Van Valkenburg is the, the landscape architect. So these would be ginkgo trees. One enters the building through this reading garden. And then there's a strip of, of restored ancient East River uh, uh, water garden here with frogs and turtles and everything that they could have an educational laboratory of water here. But the building itself is a kind of prism of this vertical condition. There's a view through the arrival garden of the ginkgo trees. The feeling of those cuts showing the children's library, the main library, and the slice of the circulation route up that stair moving across the facade. So the entire, the entire building is concrete, uh, no columns, with spanning 40 feet, and the entire building is sheathed in 100% recycled foamed aluminum. So there'll be an insulation on the outside and then this, this foamed aluminum skin on the, on the exterior. So it has this kind of glowing uh, uh, quality at night and it'll, it has a kind of texture Otherwise, and then views from the inside back to Manhattan are also shaped by these cuts. Everything is open, so it's like one big space. Here is my, my reading, my research. I worked on this for six months, and I read every single book about libraries, like Umberto Eco, Lost in Libraries. And the view, the, the, the sort of presence of the building from Manhattan, looking back, Again, the context of the Pepsi-Cola sign and this sort of presence of this building in the distance. So this notion of a, of a small building, an ambiguous form, uh, in, in a way becomes a kind of iconic presence for the, for the community library, drawing the community in. So conclusion, how can you conclude on ambiguity? This is an ambiguous photograph of the Mars uh, lander spirit stuck in the lunar uh, in the martian talcum dust uh, it's been there for i think a couple years now um, it's stuck in the dust but it's still sending back photographs and they thought it wouldn't be able to send back photographs because they thought the solar panels would clog up with dust but the the wind on mars blows them clean and free so it's still sending back images I think today, 
uh, my idea of ambiguity is really something that has to do with taking uh, the ambiguity as a positive as well as a negative, but then saying in a way that concept as a heuristic device is a way of transcending the ambiguity, a, a way of giving architecture a kind of backbone, a kind of, let's say, a kind of force. But in the end, I, I go back to my original uh, book about idea and phenomena. It's really not just the idea that's driving the design, but it's the phenomena of the experience of architecture which is the most important. Thank you.